With alarms sounding about a housing affordability crisis and rental vacancy rates in parts of Ontario at near historic lows, that perennial debate over rent control is back. A private member's bill currently before the Ontario legislature seeks to extend the current rent control regime to every unit in the province. Not surprisingly, opinions about that vary greatly. Let's hear some of them now with Kelly Bentley. She is Federation of Metro Tenants Association's representative. Marva Burnett, president of Acorn Canada. That's a tenants' rights group as well. Jim Murphy, president, CEO, Federation of Rental Housing Providers of Ontario. And Stephen Scanlon, landlord of an eight-unit building in downtown Toronto. And we are happy to rekindle this debate here on TVO tonight, a debate that's been going on actually for about 70 years in the province of Ontario. And just to bring sort of you and our viewers up to scratch on all of the background, we've got this sort of handy-dandy, minute-long background piece that we'll play now, and then we'll come back and chat, okay? Mr. Director, roll it, please. The debate around rent control isn't exactly new. Rent control was first introduced under the National Housing Act way back in 1944, but it didn't stick around long. It popped up again in 1975 when it became a major provincial election issue. Here it is being debated on TVO's The Education of Mike McManus. And yes, there was well, live piano accompaniment back then. Rent control, although politically attractive in a very short-term point of view, leads to a lot of very disastrous results for a lot of people. Most the beginnings of what we now know as rent control became official in 1979 under the provincial government of, you guessed it, Bill Davis. Then in 1992, faced with a shortage of rentals, Bob Ray's government introduced a five-year exemption on rent controls. Fast forward to 1996, and rent control was once again in the headlines. And they say that if we get rid of rent controls, we'll be back in the position where they won't be building condos. In fact, they'll be building... The Mike Harris government then introduced Bill 96. Under that bill, any rental units constructed after 1991 were exempt from rent control. But anything built prior to that was still capped by the provincial law. The hope was that developers would be encouraged to build more units. The question is, has it worked? Okay, that's some of the background on our discussion to be. And Jim, I want to start with you. How well is the current system working for you? One of the things about the 1991 exemption specifically, Steve, was to provide certainty, certainty for investors. One of the things that we need in Ontario is investment in the real estate sector and apartments is part of that. So it's important that that continue. When rules change, and in this area they've changed uh, over a number of years, that's not good for investors to build product and provide housing needs for Ontarians, for Torontonians, whether they be ownership or whether it be tenant related. We have seen in the last couple of years a significant increase in the commitment from builders of new purpose-built rental. Purpose-built so, rental meaning? Purpose-built rental meaning professionally managed. So if you walk around any major city in Ontario or you drive around, you see a building that you think is an apartment building, it is professionally managed by a third party. And those buildings we saw in Toronto last year, a 50% increase in commitment to construction. And we see through Urbanation, which is a consulting firm here in Toronto, a commitment across the GTA to 28,000 new units. This is an all-time high and, and a record. Let me ask the follow-up question then. If all apartment units are put under rent control, in other words, not just those before 1991, but everything, what do you think would happen? Well, one of the things that would happen is you get into what housing economists would call the secondary market. So you get into a lot of condominiums that aren't necessarily purpose-built rental. And the City of Toronto estimates there's nearly 100,000 in the City of Toronto alone. And so it's a very different dynamic because you have much smaller owners or investors that may have one or two units as opposed to a large purpose-built building. Okay, Marvin, let's go to you. How well do you think the current system is working for tenants? I don't think the current system is working well enough for tenants today because right now we are pricing a lot of tenants and hardworking Ontarians out of the market. If we, have to ha if we don't have rent control, what's going to happen? Like a couple of days ago, what happened? Somebody got noticed that their rent is going up from 1,600 to 3,200. Is this what we want for all Ontarians? We at Acorn is saying we should have rent control and we should end vacancy decontrol. We should end above the guideline rent increase. And we should include every building, including those built after 1991, in the rent control. A little follow-up there. Vacancy, what did you say? Vacancy decontrol? decontrol? What does that mean? 
So vacancy decontrol means that when a unit becomes empty, a particular, when any unit becomes empty, empty, a landlord can increase the rent by whatever they want. There's no barrier to how high they can put kind it. Kind of starts so, the clock again, if you Exactly. Like so even if you are in a rent-controlled unit that predates, is, predates the 1991 exemption, um, when that unit becomes vacant, you could increase it by whatever the market allows or whatever you want to. So it could be $500, it could be $1,000. How much of that is actually happening? I mean, it does happen. Every time a unit becomes vacant, it increases. Generally, in the condo market, it increases a lot more either way, um, but they are increasing. And certainly, I do want to add that the average tenant only lives in a unit for around five years. I mean, there are some long-term tenants that stick around for 30 years or more, particularly seniors, you know. But um, generally, there is turnover in these units. So there's so, always an opportunity for, the, for market adjustments, even in rent control units. So you're saying even in the average situation, if it's turning over every five years, that's an opportunity every five years for the landlord to go beyond what rent controls would allow for an increase. Exactly. Exactly. Okay. Stephen, how well is, in your view, the current system working for you? Yeah, I mean, it's working fine for me, but I don't think the system is working um, very well at all. Um, I think you have a severe uh, supply issue. Um, but I don't think applying rent controls across the board is really the answer. I really worry about it, um, you know, stunting uh, investment interest and stunting supply. So the unintended consequence is that you actually restrict supply and, and you create housing problems. So. Uh, you know, I, I think some measure of rent controls does make sense because what's going on right now is the Wild West, but I don't think it needs to be as ex extreme as, you know, what I face with my older building. Can I just uh, focus on that for a little bit here? Sure. You, you've got a, an eight-unit building? Yes. Whereabouts in town? So it's in Cabbage Town. In Cabbage Town, okay, which is a kind of a gentrifying part of the old city of yes, Toronto. Yes, wonderful location. It, yes. yes, actually a very, uh, very desirable place for a lot of people to live. Yes. Uh, we heard about this, what did you call it again? Vacancy? Right, vacancy decontrol. Vacancy decontrol. How often does that happen in your experience in your building? Um, it's happening less and less because the, the people that used to come into my building and uh, would buy a house after three, four years, it's, it's no longer affordable. So I'm, my turnover is minimal. Um, but when uh, someone does leave, I do have the opportunity to raise it as high as I want. But I would rather be, be a bit more reasonable with, with my rents and have um, greater selection about who I allow in the building. Is your building Can a I, pre or post-91 building? Oh, it's uh, pre-1991. Pre-91. So pre-1900. <laughs> <laughs> so you are caught under like, full-blown rent control for your building? Absolutely, yeah. And therefore, you can only put the rent up annually by how much? By the, um, the, uh, the ministry puts out the amount every year, but it's gen generally equal to CPI. So it, Roughly it's 1.5% this year. It was 1.5% gotcha. this year. It yeah. was 1.5%. Yeah. Could you speak to the issue that Marva brought up, which is, I mean, and, you know, funnily enough, this week we have seen this, you know, rather significant example of somebody whose rent went from 1600 to over $3,000 in one fell swoop. I mean, would you acknowledge that's a pretty tough pill to swallow? I don't think anybody can support a doubling of somebody's rent. Um, what we need to have is a, a discussion to find a solution. We don't need to go back to the same old, same old, because that's going to hurt tenants the most, because it's going to mean less supply and less choice. Uh, in the last couple of weeks, Steve, I've actually gone through two new rental buildings, one of them not very far from here at all, just north of Young and Eglinton here in uh, Midtown Toronto. And it's a 90-unit new building of which 30 people moved from an adjacent building that the builder built. And so those are 30 units that have been freed up in a much larger building that are more affordable. And so if we go back to put rent controls in and stronger rules, that is going to discourage all the new supply that's in the pipeline that we need. I think that the province wants. Uh, municipalities, the province want rent construction. Uh, and this is the wrong time to revisit that and go back to the old solutions. We need to find something else. We've actually been in consultation with the province. We haven't heard back from them. But we want to provide some solutions so that we just don't go back to the same old, same old that's going to result in less units and less supply for tenants. Let's follow up on that. Marva, do you acknowledge the premise of his argument, which is if you put controls on everything, builders will stop building new rental units. I don't, because they've had it like this for how many years now? Since in 1972, this with the rent control on buildings, Barbary did what he came, had to Came in in the middle 70s. Right. Rent controls initially came right. in the middle 70s. So how many, build, how many apartment buildings have been built since then? How many, how many units have we made since then? We keep saying that rent control won't produce any, but how many have you guys produced for this time since you know, all buildings built after 1991 has been exempted? 
So when rent controls came in in the mid-70s after the 75 election, we saw an absolute stop in the construction of purpose-built rental. The tax rules that favored multi-purpose building was in 1971. We still had a lot of new rental units between 71 and 76 when rent control came in. Then the NDP government, in its rent control legislation in 1991, brought in uh, rent control legislation and brought in an exemption for new rental. The Conservative government in 1997, in their iteration of rent control, made it permanent. And so what investors and builders require is certainty. Any investor requires certainty in the market. And so we are now seeing that, and we've seen a huge commitment. Some of these projects take three or four years to happen. We've seen a huge commitment in the pipeline to that, and that provides more supply to tenants. And I fear that this will be put at risk if we just go back to the old. So what we said to the province is let's have a conversation about finding out some other solutions okay, I'm that get might to work. That. I'm going to get to the solutions in a second. But, but Kelly, I, I mean, I do need to follow up on that. Even the new Democratic Party government of the early 1990s apparently realized that if you put controls on everything and don't allow exemptions for new construction, you're going to stop construction entirely. If they thought that was the case, why don't you think that's the case? Well, we've had 26 years of the current legislation. We've had 26 years to look at how purpose-built um, rental units are being built in this city. And it's not panning out insofar as there's not enough purpose-built, even condo-built rental units to deal with the current lack of affordable housing or any housing in this city. So for example, I was reading a statistic from CMHC, the Canadian Housing and Mortgage Company, and they said in between 2015 and 2016, 1,511 units were completed in the GTA. When you take into account the loss of rental units due to the demolition and conversion of rental units, there was actually only a net gain of 544 units that year. Hmm. There's a vacancy rate. almost 1,000 came off the market. Yes, because yeah. every time a new condo was built and it's built where tenants live, those, you lose some of those units because the only ones that get replaced are the ones that hit the mid-range um, low-income threshold set out by the City of Planning Act. So you actually lose purpose-built rental units over the course. And then you end up with a situation where we're depending on the secondary market to build housing. Well, the secondary market creates uncertainty for tenants. And as we just spoke about, I mean... Recently, tenants were getting 100% rent increases. And why is that? Because the company that rents out those units gone bankrupt. Now, mm. if you live in Briar Lane, a purpose-built management company, and that company goes bankrupt, your rent increase is the guideline. So either whether a bank is operating it or a new owner is operating it, so there's certainty there. You cannot use a secondary market to predict long-term rental construction. And the current way this, the system is, is constructed is it hasn't really dealt with the increased vacancy problem. You want to come back on that? Uh, just one point is that the secondary market, which is the condo market, mm -hmm. has essentially been the rental market since 1991. So the city of Toronto so says... people basically buy units and then rent them out. Yeah, so you have a lot of small investors of one, two, or three units. And so the city of Toronto says there's nearly 100,000. I think 60 or 70,000 of those are post-1991. That's a significant amount. And, if and you they're did, not caught under controls, presumably. They're not caught under controls, but if you didn't have them, the situation of supply would be so much worse, and that's, that's our argument. Can I ask, uh, Stephen, about another phenomenon that we hear about from time to time, which is, it's, it's a bit of a loophole here. I'm not saying you're doing it. I haven't heard that you're doing anything wrong. But, <laughs> but, I've, heard others, but I've heard others are doing it, and I want to get your view on it. Uh, I own a rental unit. I make up a story about my uncle is moving back from the old country, and I need this unit for my uncle. So you kick the people out. There is no uncle. You leave it on the market vacant for a month or something like that, and then you double the rent and you know, put somebody else in there. And that's kind of a loophole, a way to get around the rules. Yes. How much of that's going on out there? Oh, I think it, it does happen. Um, but you know, if, you, if your tenant is, is sharp, they'll watch the market, and, and, and it is against the law. So you can, you can be held accountable if you do that. But I'm sure it does happen. There's, there's no question. A lot or a little? I, I don't know. I mean, it's, it's a risk that I would never take. And I think it, it opens you up to a lot of hassle, legal and, and otherwise. And it's not, it's not ethical to begin with. But um, so I, I don't think it's happening maybe as much as, as people think. Marva, what do you think? I think it's happening a lot more than people think. How do you because know? we have members of, of ACORNs. We, ha we represent like 32,000 Ontarians on ACORN. And when you have these issues that come up, when you have t tenants calling you to tell you, oh, you know this, or, you know, I saw this and now... Here I am. 
But the problem is, it's that the, a lot of tenants, you know, they do not know their rights. And they don't understand the, the tenancy act. So they would mm -hmm. just, when my landlord gave me the notice, okay, I have 60 days to move out. So they begin looking, they're not, they're not studying that. Oh, maybe he's going to re-rent the apartment. Mm -hmm. One of the things, uh, uh, this will not come as a surprise to you. We've covered this story before. This story has been perpetual, almost for four decades. It's been around for a long time. And I mean, it seems to me you both need each other, right? You, you need him to build buildings that you can live in. He needs you to rent these buildings or he's got no sense, source of income. And yet the kind of sweet spot of compromise has always been so elusive for everybody to find. So let's do what you suggested a few moments ago and let's look at some new ideas that could potentially find the sweet spot of compromise and make everybody happy. What have you got in mind? So on this whole issue, which is around the 1991 exemption that's received a lot of media attention recently, uh, we've communicated talking about some sort of a rolling exemption. Again, the NDP government had an exemption. We want to have certainty in the investor market so that when they make a decision that it's adhered to. Because the worst thing is, is to have uncertainty, have the rules changing all the time. So what's a rolling exemption? It could be 10 years, it could be 15 years, it could be 20 years. Um, that is something that would give confidence in terms of a new build in, in the market. Um, we could talk about capping of rates for, for that, um, whatever the percentage might be. As Steve indicated, right now in Ontario, it's an annual rate of 1.5%. Um, the province sets that uh, annually. Um, so there may be something that you could look at for, for other markets or for new builds, because it's important, I think, for the government from a public policy point of view. We have this whole issue about housing. It's not just rental housing, but even on the ownership side, that they need supply and they need rental housing to meet a certain need. And so it's important that that be encouraged. And but so can I understand this? If, if, Jim, if, if they give you a rolling exemption of 10 or 20 years, and if they capped rates at what you thought was a reasonable level, your people would build apartments? Yes. They would. Yes. Does yes. that work for you? No. I mean, right now they have a 1991 exemption. They have no cap. So, and they're not building to the, to the need that the, that the Toronto, that Toronto needs in order to not have a 1.6% vacancy rate. And so... Um, what do you want to see then? Where's the sweet spot for you? Well, the sweet, spots, sweet spot for me is is rent control. Um, how much that is is to be set by the policymakers. I mean, maybe it could be sent a little, a little bit above the consumer price index. Um, but you want control on every building. I do. I do. Old and new. Exactly. Yes. Because how, how does that address his concern, though? It doesn't fully. I'm not. I'm not going to deny. Doesn't sound it. like it does at all. No. But the, my our position is this. Housing is a social need. I understand that it's also a business and landlords don't go into it because it's a social need, but it, it, it is a social need and people who live in the city need to be able to work and live here and you know not have to live three cities adjacent in order to come here. Then let me pick up on that social need angle. Stephen, if it is in fact a social need and that there is a public policy good involved in rental accommodation, should the government be looking at um, flexible shelter allowances for tenants who... Um, you know, maybe can't keep up with the rent uh, as well as they'd like to be. Mm -hmm. I think there's still a stigma attached to that, and I think there's risk, I think, that a landlord would, would look at. Um, one thing that we haven't talked about yet is the, um, is, is the second suites in houses. So is there a role for government to play uh, to subsidize that or allow tax breaks or some sort of incentives for people to um, look at their houses and maybe um, you know retrofit them, I, I read this like morning. Renting out the basement, that kind of well, thing. Well, yeah, yeah. I read this morning about a term called overhousing. So a lot of our people. My father-in-law is 83 years old. He's uh, his house. He lives alone, three-bedroom house. He's with his partner on the weekend. His house is pretty much empty for much of the time. So, so he's got too much housing. He's got too much housing, and there's a lot of that out there with boomers sitting on too much house. So you wonder. Is there an opportunity to increase the supply by allowing some incentive, government incentive, for people to retrofit their houses or, or promote that kind of thing? Well, the, just, I, I guess part of the trouble of that is most municipalities, <coughs> at least tell me, they're against basement units and these kinds of things because yes, yes. they worry the about density yes, and too much parking and all all kinds that. of differences among the municipalities mm -hmm. that aren't helping. Right. What it, can I get back to that shelter allowance idea? Do you think that, do, do you think some kind of government shelter allowance that would follow a tenant from building to building as opposed to just before that specific unit, would that get around some of your concerns? Shelter allowance? An allowance is good, 
but why don't we just have the federal, the municipal, and the provincial government working together to provide a housing? So get the you government know, get back in the housing to, business. Yes, to fund, to fund the housing market. Because we look at, at housing, in, I can look at housing as it's, we have the federal government who is who's saying they're committed to this. Then we have the provincial government, and then we have the municipal government. And then in the end, it's just the municipal government who is fighting to get all of this done. So we need for the provincial government and the federal government to do their part. What would the rental housing providers of Ontario think about that? Well, our members want to provide the housing. Our members want to build the housing. Uh, we don't need the government to build all the housing. Um, and further rent controls is going to put that at risk. Uh, and so we won't get any, uh, which won't benefit, again, tenants at all, because there'll be less choice and less options. Um, in terms of uh, providing income, one, one of the things of this whole debate that's interesting is, is it's much about income as it is about housing. And so people who have challenges with their rent or challenges with their mortgage or challenges with daycare are also the people that probably are, you know, talking about uh, other things that need to happen in terms of their, their income issues. And that's why we do support allowances and we do support portable housing benefits because it is an issue just as much about income in certain situations. And so we've always supported that as an organization in addition to the need for new supply. Okay, let's, we've got uh, literally a minute and a half to go here. Let me give sort of 20 seconds to each of you here on the following. This week, the Premier of Ontario did say that her government is developing quote unquote, substantive rent control reform. Not sure what that's gonna look like yet, but I do wanna know what your advice to her would be in what she might bring forward. Yeah, I, I'm supportive of rent controls. I think you have to have some flexibility to address the investment issue. So, um, so having it 1.5 is not gonna be the answer. You have to have more flexibility to promote that investment, promote that supply, and I think you can get something reasonable there. Martha. I think I would tell her to, you know, end the de de vacancy de control. I would say put the, an end to above the guideline rent increase and have it on every building in Ontario because they've been having it for 26 years. You have the guideline above the guideline rent increases that you've been using. The tenants pay for the landlord's work and where is it getting the tenants? Jim. Have a conversation, have a discussion, have a consultation with the industry to provide real practical solutions that will result in the continuance of new construction uh, as opposed to going back to the same old, same old, which will mean no new units. Kelly. I would say that um, look carefully at the issue of rent control and to create a policy that allows tenants to feel wherever they live in, whatever kind of unit they live in, that there is certainty and that there is predictability in their financial life. Do we hope that she comes forward with something that all of you will dislike, which means she's probably found the sweet spot? <laughs> who, who knows? <laughs> we shall see. Uh, Kelly, Marva, Jim, Stephen, thank you for coming into TVO tonight and uh, demonstrating for us once again why this is such an intractable issue uh, for so many years across the province of Ontario. Thank you. Appreciate thank it. You. Thank, you. thank you. Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning. Visit TVO.org and make a tax-deductible donation today.